This video addresses transducers. Okay, so a transducer is basically it's a analog sensor. Alright, so the official definition is a transducer is an electronic device that converts a physical quantity into an electrical signal. So that physical quantity we will refer to a lot of times as either a process parameter or a process variable. The idea is it's something we want to measure. And so it could be a physical distance, it could be a speed, it could be temperature, anything that you could think of that we want to measure and that we can build uh, a sensor to detect and generate an electronic signal would be a transducer. So looking at some of these, uh, tachometers are used to measure revolutions per minute. So we're measuring angular speed. Uh, photocells, they can detect light energy or light intensity. A piezometer can detect pressure. So um, what it basically is is a crystal and as the crystal is compressed by pressure, it says here liquid pressure. That liquid pressure could actually be air also. But as, as you have a compression, it actually generates a voltage. And we can detect that voltage and therefore uh, determine how much pressure is being applied. Now this voltage is a uh, m very small voltage. It's in the millivolt range. So, um, you know, it's very small. So we have to do something to... To increase that to send it to our PLC or whatever but it is uh, detectable. Accelerometers measure the change in speed so uh, acceleration is the change in speed. Thermocouples can measure temperature all right and so we're going to talk a little bit about exactly how do you build a, a thermocouple all right a thermocouple is made of two dissimilar materials bonded together or soldered together at one point. Uh, and the goal then is that this these two materials are going to generate a voltage that we can measure. Right. So the uh, right. so our transducers are uh, or transducers or sensors can either be an active or passive device. So thermocouples are passive sensors. And what that means is that the fact that they're going to generate a voltage based on the temperature, regardless of any, you know, they don't need any external uh, power source to make them work. They just generate a voltage. So as the temperature changes, the voltage that they generate changes. So they don't need any uh, external power source or excitation. Alright, so how do the thermocouples work? Well, the idea is if you if you take a piece of metal and you heat it up, there's we know that there's electrons and protons in the metal. And as you heat up that, depending on the type of material it is, Either the electrons get chased away from the heat or they get attracted to the heat. And so if we, uh, if we can measure how, many, how much the electrons are moved, we can measure that voltage. Now again, it's a very, very small voltage. So the idea of a thermocouple is like if we took, say, two pieces of metal that were exactly the same type of material, such as constantan, and we heated both ends up exactly the same, we would uh, effectively chase the same amount of electrons away from the heat. However, if we take two different types of materials, such as iron and constantan, iron, if you heat it up, it actually attracts the electrons. And so this basically acts almost like a little battery. So when you heat up the iron, the electrons are attracted to the end that's warmer. And if you heat up the constantan, the electrons are chased away. So we end up getting like uh, two 
little charges in the two different types of material, which gives us a larger potential difference. Okay. So um, the most common type of uh, thermocouple is known as the J-type, which is the iron and constant tan, which we're displaying here in this slide. All right. Now, most manufacturers uh, will make the uh, uh, use two wire leads for this. One will be red and one will be white. The red lead would be the low potential and the white lead is the high potential. Okay. Uh, the temperature range uh, for J-type thermocouples is very wide from minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a very large temperature range. Okay. Um, now when, as we go through the slides here you're going to see that we, we just like list different types. So like uh, T-type is actually made of copper in constant tan. And you can see the temperature range here it's uh, much smaller than that of the iron. Okay. And so um, I've got a couple of charts here just showing you the different types. Okay, So you're probably wondering what do you need to know for the test? Well you don't need to know like all the different metals and types and things. So we have T and E and J and K. What you need to know for the exam is that the J type is the most common it's made of iron and constant tan um, and it has a, a pretty high temperature range and the other thing to know about thermocouples and this could be any thermo thermocouple is the fact that they do not generate a linear curve so you can really see that if you look at the bottom blue curve here it's definitely got some bend to it but all of these uh, thermocouples, these are not perfectly straight lines. They're not linear. Okay, so there's some curvature to that. So you can't just uh, do a scaling equation like we've discussed and make a nice linear line and scale it to determine the temperature. All right. So uh, the thermocouples, kind of like the piezoelectrics, they generate a very, very small voltage. It's in the millivolt range. Okay, and again, you don't need a power source for that, so it's a passive device. Okay. Um, the, the range of millivolts there, you can see it from about minus 8 millivolts to 70 millivolts for that large temperature range. Okay. So uh, technically what you have to do with something like a thermocouple is you've got to you've got to find a cali you got you have to calibrate it and the way that you would calibrate it is we all know that at 0 degrees celsius or 32 degrees fahrenheit all right um, is is the freezing point of water so we could use that to uh, calibrate this okay so we could use that to calibrate it. Let me get to that drawing here. And so you would actually connect it up like this through an ice bath. Now the, the problem with that is, number one, it's hard to keep an ice bath. Uh, number two, it's you know kind of a messy thing to do and stuff. The, the great thing is with uh, controllers and PLCs, we don't actually have to wire it up like this because what we can do is we can basically build an electronic circuit which will give us those values. So here's just an example of a table. So this is the table for a J-type thermocouple. And what I want you, one of the things I want you to notice here is it says the reference junction is zero degrees. So there's your ice bath. Okay. And so if you have your reference junction set, then you can measure the voltage and you'll know what the temperature is. Now this particular chart is in degrees Celsius, so just uh, be aware of that. So it's in millivolts for a uh, degree Celsius here. Uh, now the thing is we can buy sp specific cards for our PLCs that we can wire uh, the, 
thermocouple directly up to the PLC or we can buy controller devices which we'll be discussing here a little bit later and they you just basically tell them hey I have a J-type thermocouple wire it up and it basically has what amounts to an electronic uh, ice bath and it has that table that it, we I just showed inside of the device so that we will know that uh, temperature. Alright, so if we're going to install a thermocouple to measure temperature, um, you know, we, we want to do this based on the surrounding. Uh, and so you, you're going to choose your type of thermocouple for your particular needs. And also the wire size becomes important because when you're heating this up, also the wires are heating up. And so you need to be uh, concerned with with your wires. If you use heavier, you know, larger diameter wire, you're going to increase the life of the wire, and it can handle higher temperatures. However, uh, it's going to respond slower because you also kind of are going to heat to some degree that wire, and it's going to take more for it to heat up. Okay, because you're basically putting a big heat sink on your thermocouple, so you're going to slow down the response of your thermocouple. Um, so if you use smaller wire, you can get a faster response to temperature changes. Thermocouples um, have, as I said, an exponential response. It's not linear. Okay. Uh, this is an example of one of the controllers or similar to one of the controllers that we're going to use and like I say basically these things are pretty neat little devices they're an electronic controller that you can wire up uh, and you basically tell it hey I've got a J type thermocouple or K type thermocouple or maybe I have an RTD or maybe I have something else and you basically program these little devices and tell it what type of transducer you've hooked up to it and it will number one it can display your it can actually display the temperature or the uh, the value that your transducer is generating so you can see it there the other thing is that these things can convert that millivolt signal or whatever signal that you're getting from your transducer into a 0 to 20 milliamp or a 4 to 20 milliamp kind of signal that we can then send a long distance over to the PLC and feed into our PLC. So if our PLC is too far away from the thermocouple, then you know because of attenuation you know that millivolt signal is just going to get lost by the time you know it gets wired you know hundreds of feet back to the PLC but if we put one of these little controllers right there on the spot to the thermocouple we can number one view the temperature or the values right there and we can have it send that 4 to 20 milliamp current signal down the line to the PLC. Alright, so um, now another type of temperature detector is an RTD. So RTD stands for resistance temperature detector and it works on the property that as you heat up most types of metal the resistance uh, changes um, usually the resistance, um, as you heat it up, the resistance is going to increase because you get these electrons bouncing all around and it's hard to get them to go the way you want, effectively. Uh, so, uh, now RTDs are active devices, so we have to have a power supply to power these things. So again, thermocouples are passive. They're going to output that millivolt temperature whether you actually hook anything to them or not. But RTDs are active. They work on resistance, the change in resistance. So we have to put a voltage in them and then measure the current to determine what that resistance is.
All right, so how does, um, now a couple of things about RTDs before I get into how they work actually is the, the temperature range. So notice, you know, the, the J couple would go up to um, 2,000 degrees, that was Fahrenheit, but it'll still go into 1,000 degrees of degrees Celsius, where the uh, temperature range of RTDs is much smaller range. Okay, and, but, uh, you know, depending on your needs, that it might give you more accurate and a more linear response. Okay. All right, so now RTDs actually come in what they call two, three, or four wire uh, configurations. Now, I would personally never get a two wire RTD. And reason for that we'll look at when we look at a three or a four wire. All right. So um, a three wire is most common. It's relatively cheap. Obviously as you add more wires it's going to cost more. So a two wire would cost less but it, you know it's not you're going to lose a lot of accuracy with it. So if you're going to get an RTD I would at least get a three wire RTD. And as I said before, we have to we have to um, excite this, right? We know that we can determine the resistance based on Ohm's law, voltage divided by current. So we apply a voltage and effectively measure the current, and we can see what the change in that resistance is going to be. All right. So now, so here's just uh, kind of the wiring of the two, three, or four wire connections. And why do we care about this? Well, this here slide shows you here the R and B here with B in parentheses. That indicates what they call the bulb. That's, that's the tip of the RTD that we're going to heat up or cool down and we want to measure the temperature. The problem is we know that all wire has resistance in it. So if we're trying to measure the resistance based on applying a voltage, dividing the voltage by using Ohm's law, um, divide it by the current to find the resistance, the problem is there's resistance in the wires. And as the wires heat up, because remember these wires are going to be running to the bulb, if the bulb's getting hot, the wires are going to get hot also. So the resistance of the wires is also going to change. So basically the idea is if we can feed wire from, or if we can feed voltage and get a current flowing from RL1 up here through the bulb over to RL2. And then if we put a current through RL2 and feed it to RL3, which doesn't go through the bulb, but the wires if we're using the same kind of wire for all three connections and they're all close together, they're going to heat up about the same. So any changes in resistance of the wires is going to be the same. And what we're going to do is we're going to subtract out those resistances. And so when we're done with that, we effectively have just the resistance of the bulb. And so any resistance changes due to the heating and the wires, we're trying to subtract it out. And that's why we're using a three wire. Um, and four wire, we're just subtract, you know, we're, we're trying to, gives us a little bit more accuracy because we're going to subtract it out effectively a second time and be more accurate. Okay, so um, load cells. Uh, load cells measure force. So we can either pull on something or we can push on something or compress it and load cells can measure that. Now the, these load cells come in all different kinds of sizes. So we can drive a truck on them and if we have a large one we can drive a truck and we can measure thousands and thousands of pounds. Or you maybe you have an electronic scale in your bathroom that um, just measures, you know, maybe uh, a few hundred pounds. Okay. And we can mount these load cells on conveyor belts and they can measure uh, 
how much material is flowing past at a given time. All right, so how does a load cell work? Well, it works off of something called the Wheatstone Bridge. Okay, you may have talked, you probably discussed this in DC circuits and maybe some other classes. The bridge circuit has been around for a long time and is very well understood that if you have three resistances that you know very well, R1, R2, and R3, and you have an unknown resistance, R4, you can detect that resistance with great accuracy with this bridge circuit. So basically what we do is we take one of these four resistors and we, that, that resistor, we make a strain gauge. Now a strain gauge is just a resistor that kind of looks like what's shown here. And we, we now fasten this to the metal frame of the load cell. And when we compress the load cell and we strain the load cell, we stretch this strain gauge. And when you stretch it or um, compress it or whatever, it's going to change resistance. And because it's part of that bridge, we even small changes of resistance we can detect very accurately. And so we use the bridge circuit with one of the resistors being a strain gauge, and we can uh, measure the accuracy very, very precisely. Okay, and we can measure either the either tension or compression within the load cell by wiring this up. So when we wire these up, we have um, red for our positive, black for ground, of course. And then your other two wires are the typically going to be a green and white wire that you're going to uh, generate a voltage on. Now the load cells are active devices, so we've got to supply them power. That's what the red and black leads are for, right? So these are active devices. They need a power supply. Okay, be very careful here when you're using the load cells, the power supply has to be about 10 volts. If you get much above 10 volts, you can basically burn out the strain gauge and ruin your load cell. So do not hook it to your 24 volt supply. All right. So this is just kind of showing you the wiring here again. Okay. Um, now the load cells will output what they call a, a rating of two millivolts per volt or three millivolts per volt, depending on how many volts you apply. So um, if you uh, if you have a load cell, you'll get about three millivolts per volt. So if you have like a 10 volt supply, your, uh, your load cell is going to range from somewhere between about zero to about 45 uh, millivolts okay so for every volt um, for every volt you get about two to three millivolts out of that okay. all right so here's an example here we're gonna we're gonna supply 10 volts to this with a output rating of three millivolts per volt. Okay, so then at, at 100 pounds, um, if this was our rating at 100 pounds, we'd actually be getting about 30 millivolts out of this load cell. Okay, so in general, the, the voltage of the load cell, the output voltage ranges between about zero to 45 millivolts, depending on your load cell, but that's most most load cells will have that range okay so again this outputs a millivolt signal it's very small so you you know you've got to be got to have something that you're sensing that with fairly close to the load cell otherwise the attenuation is going to make that millivolt signal even smaller so uh, using a converter 
or a controller that will output, we can then generate a 4 to 20 milliamp signal to feed a PLC that is further away. Now, we've talked a little bit before about power supplies, but they make specific um, power supplies for things like load cells. And the idea here is what the you, you have your DC voltage, but then they also have a sensing wire. So you basically, because you want to measure the voltage at the load cell. And so if you're setting the voltage to 10 volts or whatever, you don't want... You want that voltage to be 10 volts at the load cell, not, you know, uh, 30, 40 feet away. And remember, there's resistance in all these wires. And so the idea is that if we, uh, if we have a power supply that has some built-in senses, we run a second wire to the sensors. And it's basically a voltmeter, and it's measuring the voltage at the load. Now, remember, voltmeters have very high resistance up uh, up into the range of say 10 million ohms and so what will happen here is there will be very little current going to the sensors so it um, so the it doesn't really affect it and so you're measuring the voltage at the load not the voltage at the power supply so any voltage being dropped across the resistance on the wires you're eliminating that and so this will monitor it and maintain that the load cell close to the load cell you're keeping that voltage at 10 volts because because of that sensitivity of the load cell if your wire was to heat up and have more resistance and your voltage dropped then you would you would get a poor reading from your load cell and so the idea is we use a smart uh, power supply here that is measuring the voltage at the load or at the load cell so that it and it'll automatic these are smart power supplies so they'll detect that any drop in voltage due to heating in the wires and they'll adjust the voltage to compensate for that so that your load cell is always maintained at that uh, 10 volts or whatever that you calibrated it for. Okay. Now, obviously, you know, this is a more complicated power supply, so it's going to cost a little more money, but, you know, you're, you're paying to get more accuracy out of your product. So this is just a picture of one of the converters that's possible that uh, can convert you know, these millivolt uh, signals or thermocouple signals into 4 to 20 milliamp signals to send to our PLC. Uh, and this is just uh, another model here, the red line. This is actually the one that we have in the classroom. All right. And so, um, and I have the manual of this posted in Blackboard so you can read over these. This is... Uh, the controller that we're going to use for lab five, uh, for week five, well, it's not week five, but for the lab five, where we're going to hook up uh, both an RTD to this and a load cell, and we're going to have to program these things. And so uh, I'll try to do a video on actually programming these, but you basically have to press the P for program uh, until you see the letters CNFP. Uh, show up and that's for configuration and programming and then you um, can arrow in and get to the inputs and arrow through and make your uh, uh, changes okay so um, uh, like I say I'll, I'll try to do a video with uh, a controller so that you can kind of see how to program these. But uh, the key is you, you kind of have to press and hold the P button until you see this configure and program. CNFP stands for configure. Um, and uh, when that pops up there, then you hit the arrow to get to input. Then you press the P button uh, and, and so on. So it just takes a little bit of practice to program these. They're, 
little awkward the first couple times you do it, but after you do it a couple times, it's it's not too bad of a task. <laughs>